This is Capital City with Capital J. Yeah. Okay. Um, we let me see what else. Let me see. I'm just writing down stuff that I know. He's, you know, production, the machine, hot right, my brother, camp yeah. low. Right. You know, it's just random, just all things that that he was involved with. Right. You know what I'm saying? Um. Are we going? Okay, we 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 going through it. I Let's mean, go through it. I I I, I, I want to you, know. You gotta think because we did when we like this is like if you really think about it, man. Dude is legendary. It's a legendary, yeah, producer at this point. Absolutely, because you know, in hip hop, the producers overlooked a lot of times. Yes, you know, um, yeah. <clears throat> like um, uh, Larry Smith. You know, we talked about him back in the day, Orange Crush. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? This right. dude is is influencing Cameo and 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 Run DMC, Houdini. You know, mm-hmm. and these. You know, when you think that sound, you, you know, he was responsible for the sound, but you don't know who really did it. You see what I'm saying? Right. And it's like, oh, so that guy, mm-hmm. and he's 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 underrated or not heard of in the general conversation but behind the scenes this dude is a legend you know what i mean right and ski's been around like you know behind the scenes on so many things that you're like god these sporty thieves yeah remember no pigeons no pigeons. <laughs> i mean you know yeah. you're talking about a catalog that's lasted over yeah. a long period of time yeah and he's still working and he's still working still relevant it's still relevant. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I mean, when I look at the list of um, people that he worked with and some of the tracks, like, I think one of the dopest tracks in the world to me is um, Ultimate High by Nature. Oh. Nice. I did not know Ski did that. Hey, man. <laughs> that, oh, man. Yes, <laughs> that was <clears throat> that album for all seasons. Yeah, boy, man. But that that particular track on that joint always stuck out to me. Yeah, Ultimate high. Yeah, oh man, <laughs> great stuff, man. Great yeah. stuff. You making me pull this up, man? <laughs> Just the old the 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 stuff that shit. I grew up to this kind of stuff, man. <coughs> it was certain tracks. You know, and he was a part of the list of tracks. Peace out, leaving home just to change my phone plan. <laughs> hang on, hang on. I know, I know. I got to, you always got to go through the ad. We're going to oh. end all this off anyway because we can't, we're not going to be able to play a whole lot of music. No way, right? Right. Yeah, so, you know. You know what the first comment says? One of the illest hip hop beats ever created. Ever, <laughs> ever, and nature just skating across it. But that beat, yeah, man. It was. Ooh. There was a point in my life when every time I heard that song, I would start and do a two step. <laughs> yeah. No matter where I was, I would start and do a two step. That's crazy. Yeah, boy. <laughs> From the producer. Now, my favorite, my favorite all time, um, ski beat, huh. was pace one. I declare war. I declare war. Okay. Mm, you remember that one? Kind of. Kind mm. of. That was that was that was early for me. I am getting ready. To, I'm going to drop it on you. Here you go. <clears throat> This is a special news break. The mayor will announce today that he is declaring war on rap and that all rap uh, opposition candidates. A nice song with a melody. Hmm, Eminem's in the video. Yo, wow. <laughs> yo. This joint right here, my favorite. This is my favorite ski beat all day. Okay. Now I remember. Uh huh. Get the 
Mm, my face is balled up like a anus right now. <laughs> Or the mayor. Woo! Man. Yeah, so dude was behind the scenes of a lot of daggone good stuff. Right. <clears throat> right, right. Absolutely he was. And, you know, people, that's the kind of stuff where you're like, oh, I remember that. I remember that. Right. She never took the time to think about who produced it. Who produced it. Yeah. And... And those songs like this, this is an era right here where you had this these kind of songs where the beat and the rhymes are like the perfect marriage. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. You had some good MCs on some good beats, and it mm-hmm. came together and made some good music, you know. <clears throat> and and it's kind of rare when the two meet today. You know, sometimes I hear somebody with really good lyrics and I don't like the beat that much. <laughs> or I love the beat and I don't really like the lyrics that much, but the beat is, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it used to be an abundance of lyrics that matched these dope beats back in the day. Yes, sir. You had to. You know what I mean? You had to. Yeah, that was fire right there. Like right. like that dude right there. Let me this is how the era was. That dude right there was killing that beat. Mm-hmm. He didn't go nowhere because mm-hmm. it was everybody was killing the beat, right? So he didn't even stand out. But you take this level, you know, you take somebody who rapping like this now, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. you be like, "Whoa, where did that guy come from?" <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Right. He came from like 1998. <laughs> That's where he came from. <laughs> you were never lie. That's where he came from. You about ready to make that call, man? Yes. What time is nine eleven? <laughs> get this thing right. Well, one time for your mind. It's Capital City. I'm your host, Capital J. This is my main man, DL Glass. We're in the building today. Right now, this is just the intro. We're gonna spend a little time talking with um, legendary producer, hip hop icon. Ski Beats. <laughs> if I could find the message. Yep, and in the meantime, you know, we're just talking and reminiscing about some of our favorite Ski Beat classic joints. I do believe DL said um, Ultimate High. Yes. By nature. Yes. <clears throat> like, that, that it's, it, I'm not going to say my, you know, that one, but it's up there. Yeah. Yeah, it's up there because if if you're just looking at his catalog, like it's it's a it's a few of them. But well, you like, know, for me it was the, it was Pace One out of Claire War. Yeah, man. Yeah, that you know before that, ugh, ugh, is you who it. you with, Jay Z? Yeah, boom boom man. Ba-dum. Boom, 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 <laughs> boom, doo, 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 got flack doo, for that though, doo, man. Doo, doo, doo. Got flack for that. Yes. Who? Not ski. Jay Z did for what? For that track. Why? That whole album he got flack that was, for kind of. That was on a soundtrack or something. Yeah, but it I was, think who you with was on the soundtrack during that era when he was making. I uh, think he also did. That's when that you belong to the city and all that. that he did. Album, yeah, he what was, was that. <clears throat> S. Doc Carter too. Or? Yeah, it was, it was bad. The, the, some of the other stuff around that era might not have been that great. Right, right. But that song was a hit. Hey, absolutely. Out, hey. out in the park. <laughs> hey, bitch, who you with? You know what I'm saying? More flows to get. <laughs> More O's than you know exist. <laughs> <laughs> who you with? True story. Never mind. Yeah, uh, yeah. Lead that. Yeah. Leave that in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> I was a Twitter way yo freshman in college with a minivan. <laughs> uh, that sounds like me and my brother. Okay, I text him. All right. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. Hello? Ski. Yeah. Hey, what's up, man? What's up, man? It's Capital J, man. Capital J. What up, brother? What's happening, man? Man, I'm chilling. I'm chilling. Hey, Can't good. complain. My man, we got DL Glass. Y'all met. How you doing, brother? How you doing? What's up, man? 
Good to hear from you, brother. Good to hear from you. Yeah, sorry about last week, man. Or whenever that was, I got I was I totally just I forgot <laughs> my bad. <laughs> yeah, I get it. What y'all up to? Man, we just sitting here. Well, actually, you know, while we were waiting, we actually started talking, trying to figure mm-hmm. out, you know, what's our favorite ski bees joint. You know what I mean? And okay. which which really got us digging through a long catalog. <laughs> 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 you know what I'm saying? So so I guess before we even get to that point, man, you know, we on and for anybody who doesn't know you, I'm going to start and you just finish for me, okay? Okay. All right. Right about now on the phone, we have Ski Beats, legendary North Carolina producer, worldwide He's been involved in hip-hop since the 80s and is still out here working. Still relevant, still important. Now, what we want to know first is how does a kid from Greensboro, North Carolina, into the the sphere of hip-hop in the way that you did and become, you know, get get rooted and, and make this thing that you made? Man, you know, it all started with that that love, you know what I'm saying? That spark that you know, what I think I went to a um man, so many so many facets to this man. Like my brother, like back when I was a kid, my brother and his friend, um, they had got this record, uh what was the name of that record? Who made that song? Old school joint, Don't Stop the Music, Don't You Stop the Y'all Y'all Burn Peoples. Right. They was playing that record and they was rapping. And I'm like, yo, what are y'all doing? You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I, I, I just, as soon as I heard them try to rap, I just gravitated to a crazy. Right. And, you know, when they when they left the room, I just started you know, trying to write little raps and stuff. And that was my first, you know, um, introduction to hip hop. And then I started, you know, hearing, you know, groups like the Sugar Hill Gang and you know, all these, you know, King Tim the Third groups like that. And that, you know, that just obviously, you know, put the battery in my back. But I think it really went went crazy for me when I went to my first Fresh Fest. Remember the Fresh Fest? Right. When you come to Greensboro? Right. I yeah, do. when I went to the, yeah, when I went to my first Fresh Fest, man, and I saw like one DMC, LL Cool J, Salt Pepper, Fat Boys, all of them live on stage, the uh, Dynamic Breakers. And I just saw, you know, that, 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 the culture. Right. And that's when I was like, yo, I got to do this. This is like what I want to do, you know? I, and I that's when I, mm-hmm. and that's when I, you know, the universe, man, God just started, you know, putting people in my life. You know, Eli introduced me to Mix Master D. Bless your soul, man. I was, you know, he taught me, him and Fanatic taught me everything. Um, it's, Introduced me to Mix Master D. Mix Master D introduced me to Fanatic. Fanatic, you know, at the time they had a group called the Crush MCs, and one of their MCs, uh, GM2, he was about to, I think, go to college, so he couldn't be in the group anymore. So he asked me if I wanted to, you know, get down. And I was like, yeah, it sounds dope. And uh, boom, once I hooked up with them, man, they started, you know, introducing me to microphones and drum machines and turntables, you know, all that hip hop stuff. You know what I mean? I do, man. And, uh, <laughs> and I locked in. I locked in with it, man. I just locked in. You know, obviously, those who know me, you know, I started with the Busy Boys, was the MC first. Um, but I always kind of dabbled around with the beats, you know, watching Fanatic. He had the SP 1200. You know, when he wasn't on it, I would get on it and kind of like, you know, watch what he was doing and, you know, try to, you know, uh, emulate what he was doing until I kind of figured out, you know, what the SP 1200 did. And then when the Busy Boys broke up, uh, I don't know what year that was, but when they broke up, you remember uh, Roland? You know he was from New York originally. Yeah, R.I.P. R- 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 Roll, man. For those who don't know Roll, man, he was uh, the owner of uh, Payroll Records, mm. where we put a lot of you know Busy Boys put a lot of uh, the music on that label. But anyhow, you know when the Busy Boys broke up, Roll was about to move back to New York, and uh, he asked me if I wanted to go. It was me, him, and Nyborn, and. um, I left, man. I had my SP-1200. Got my mom's permission. That's how long ago it was. I had to get permission. Got my mom's permission to leave. 
And once I got to New York, man, it was just, it was on after that, man. I just went, I went into it deep. Right. And so this, so this will be around the time that I'm hearing you in original flavor. Is this what, the, the, the catalyst to that movement right there? Yeah, yeah, it was almost original flavor time. When I moved to New York, uh, we was in Jersey first. Um, Roland, he hooked up with this guy named Jeffrey. He owned a studio in Inglewood, New Jersey. <clears throat> and um, I lived there. I just stayed in the studio. I never left the studio. And uh, one day, Schwab, my first partner with original flavor, he came through the studio with this um, this cop who rapped. And the cop was looking for beats. Now, the studio had a Studio A and a Studio B. And I was always in Studio B. And the Studio A was this guy from uh, Canada named Marlon. And they was trying to get beats from him. But Marlon, you know, his thing was like dance music. So he didn't really do hip-hop. But he told the cop, like, hey, there's a kid in the back. He does a lot of hip-hop beats. You might want to talk to him. And so when I met Schwab and Jerome, the cop was asking me where I lived. What was going on, you know, with me? You know, your beats are dope. How can I get these beats? And I'm like, well, I live in this studio right here. This is where I stay. And he said, well, I got an apartment that has a whole studio in it. And if you make my beats, I'll let you stay in that apartment. Because right now I'm still with my girl, so I'm not even staying there. Oh so, you know, God. right. <laughs> so he was a cop. So, I, like, you know, I kind of trusted him. I'm like, all right, let me, you know, yeah, let me man, see the spot. Safe. <laughs> right. right, right, exactly. So he took me over to Harlem. Saw the crib. It was dope. It was laid out. It was a nice crib. Had the full studio, mixing board, mics, everything right there. And I'm like, oh, this is it right here. So, I, you know, I took him up on his offer. Started making his beats. And while I was making his beats, I was, me and Swall was, you know, building a relationship. And, you know, he was letting, you know, he was rhyming, letting me hear his rhyme. And I like to slow. And I was so used to being in a group. I said, yo, let's make a group, man. You know, you rap, I rap. It's called Original Flavor Boom Boom. So while I'm making the beats for this cop, I'm making, I'm working on original flavors demo. And um, to back to to go back in time a little bit. Now you know when we started the Busy Boys, you know we used to open up, you know, a lot of shows at the Coliseum and, and you know places in Greensboro. And um, we met a lot of artists. And one of the artists that we met was Dana Dane, Dane. Mm. and Clark Kent. You know, obviously was Dana Dane Dane's DJ. Right. So Clark was like, you know, hey, if you guys ever come to New York, look me up. And I so happened to have his number while I was in New York. And when I had the tape ready, I called Clark. And the timing was perfect because Clark had just got to the position of uh, a and on at Atlantic Records. So he told me, hey, bring the thing. I'll definitely listen to it. Brought it up there. He wasn't there when I brought it. So I left it with the um, lady at the desk. But what, a week later, he called me and was like, yo. This thing is dope. Uh, Atlanta Records want to sign you. And then, boom, that's how I started. And the day I signed my deal, Dame Dash was there with his cousin, Darian Dash. And Clark was like, hey, Dame Dash want to manage you. Uh, and, you know, I'm like, just happy to get a deal. I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah, of course. Come on, let's go. You know what I mean? Right. And then that's, you know, that's how I connected with Dash. The same day I got my deal. And from there, you know, it was just a whirlwind, man. Just, you know, Jay came into play. Everything just started happening. Man, this you know, I want to say something, and 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 I please, I, I don't want to interrupt your story, but I just the first part of your story, I I we've sat here and had many podcasts, and all those people you named, and well, and you included, I have told a lot of similar stories from my mm -hmm. own perspective with the same people in it. You see what I'm saying? Rogan yeah, yeah, for sure. And and Dana and <laughs> Fanatic and not born and it's mm -hmm. and it's the same stuff man i was like yo this is this is how it happens and uh um, yeah yeah all those people were, were instrumental in so many ways even clark kent uh it didn't didn't he used to come down here and dj back in the day sometimes too yep i believe so right right so so it's it's crazy, man. Like these same people, if anybody who's listened to this podcast, you've heard these names over and over again because I've mentioned them as being so instrumental to anybody having any type of success in hip hop around here. Right. And then for you to yeah. come on and you mention the exact same people that I've been naming. <laughs> so man, hey, it was it was definitely instrumental for us back then, man. Right. Definitely, man. Right. Definitely. 
Yep. So, so we we passed. We we in the original flavor. But state. really, I mean, I mean, not to cut you off, but really, yeah. the most important people to me was Fanatic, Dana, Mark Spark, Eli. Those are the most important people to me and how I came up. Those are like you know that's the root. You know what I'm saying? That that started everything. It's, I, I look at me being in the Busy Boys and me doing the hip hop thing in North Carolina. For all them years, it was like me going to like a four or five year college, getting my education. So when I went to New York, I was already, you know, trained in how to perform in shows. I was already Same. trained with how to make songs and do beats. You feel me? Yep. And and I came to Greensboro and went to the same school you did with the same people. <laughs> yep. I, just, I just had a conversation a couple of weeks back and we talked about how I said, man, you know, when I first got there, I didn't know how to work the SP. And one day, Fanatic actually spent some time with me when he stayed over there near, near UNCG. And mm-hmm. this is like when I first got to Greens, when I'm a freshman in college, I, I didn't know him like that. And that was, I thought that was really awesome for him to even spend, take the time. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. but he did that, man. And and then later, I met K Nice and through him, I meet Roland and Nyborn, and Nyborn spent a little more time with me on the SP. And then Dana yeah. showed me some more stuff. And <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I yeah. learned I learned from f- through the same circle. And we and we talked about how, you know, the production, even the, the production, the way that, that you work the SP, you know, there are a lot of things that are shared amongst the group. <laughs> Yeah, that yeah. I, you know that I know because we all, you know, right. learn in the in a similar circle early on. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. but it's it's good it's good that you're coming here. It's it's direct confirmation, man, that that all these people are so legendary and important to the to the blueprint of, of North Carolina hip hop and hip hop in general, not just North Carolina. This is more far reaching than just oh, our yeah. area. So, oh yeah. <clears throat> So yeah, man. Sorry to interrupt you, man. We we with original flavor now. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, original flavor. Yeah. So boom, you know we get the deal. Uh, you know we do the first album, second album. We do the second album. Uh, Suave. He didn't make the second album. He kind of left the group. So I I connected with Tone Hooker. That's what I mean. Tone became you know partner. He became my new partner. And around that time, um, Clark had found Jay Z and wanted to introduced Jay-Z to Dane because he thought, you know, Dane can manage him and, you know, it would get some things popping. So uh, I remember Jay-Z, Jazzo, and Source Money coming to um, one of our video shoots. And um, Clark was like, yo, you know, Jay, this is Dane. Kid, I was talking about, you know, I think he'll be a good manager for you. Boom, boom, boom. And Dane was like, yo, let me hear you guys spit something. And all three of them brothers was crazy nice. But Jay, you know, he, he kind of stood out. You know what I'm saying? But they was all, like, incredibly punchline time. And, you know, like, when a comedian tells a good joke, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, their punchlines were so perfectly timed. You just looked at them like, wow. And um, when I heard Jay rap, I knew I wasn't going to rap no more. I'm like, you know what? <laughs> I'd rather spend my time. Because I, I, I'm not as good as him, and I'm never going to be as good as him. So I'd rather take the time and, you know, just create some music for this kid because this kid is dope. What so what we did was, kid? wow, that was like 90, 94, 95, 96, somewhere in that area. Okay. Um, right. And, um, you know, obviously we put Jay-Z on uh, Can I Get Open. Um, since we, you know, we was the first ones with the deal that was with Dan, we put him on Can I Get Open to kind of bring him out with us. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, so I, when, I when, you know, we did our look, right. When we did our little college tours and things like that, we always brought Jay with us. Um, but you know, Jay always, you know, he always shined when when he came out with us. And so, you know, when we, you know, after we got off the road, we went back to New York. That's when, um, you know, Jay started coming around the crib, and I was just, you know, making beats, and he was just writing, and we was just coming up with songs. Clark was working with him. I was working with him. Uh, obviously, you know, Primo and Everybody else is on the album. But me and Clark, we did like Clark initially. He did the initial groundwork because Clark had already had like maybe four or five songs already recorded with Jay, you know, from the Cash and the Thoughts, you know, all them mm-hmm. songs that was on the album. Right. And, you know, when we heard those, we kind of caught the vibe and the energy of where he wanted to go. And then, you know, I kind of 
I kind of put my spin on it. Um, and a lot of the music that I made for Reasonable Doubt, a lot of the sounds were definitely inspired by uh, Mark Spark. Because I used to hang out in the studio. Because Mark was really the first one out of all of us to start getting placements. He was working with, like, what, Mary J. Blige, Grand Poover, like, yeah. the whole Uptown crew. You know what I'm saying? He was the first one. So I used to always go to D&D with him and just listen to what he was doing. It was just incredible. So I kind of caught that, that that jazzy bug, you know. Right, bug right. got kind of, you know, feel from him. And I just put my spin on it. And, um, yeah, and, you know, we worked, we worked, we worked. We had a whole album. Before Reasonable Doubt, we had did like a whole other album that we never even came out with before Reasonable Doubt. Um, and then we start, you know, and then we start making the songs that actually made the, uh, you know, the Reasonable Doubt. Well, my songs. So, so from that ended up on the album. From a fan perspective, I, I want to know, feeling it, like what's the vibe like for feeling it. Feeling it, man. Feeling it, you know. If you know the story, I don't know if you know the story behind feeling it, but that was my song. I was uh, working on a solo album because mm -hmm. original flavor we had, you know, we had broke up, and um, I was working on a solo album. So I had did the song. That was my first single. I did did the song feeling it. It was me, my homegirl Mecca. She was singing a hook, mm -hmm. and I had Gucci Sway from Cam Lo on it, and, um, and I was excited about that record, you know. Right. And I, I went to Dame Crib. I said, yo, check it out. I think I got my first single. It's about to be crazy. <laughs> I played it for him, and Jay-Z was there. Uh, and they heard it. And, you know, Jay was like, yo, man, you know, I need that for my album, man. I need that. Uh, you know, and I'm a team player. And I knew he was going to, you know, crush it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, the, But the, the dope thing was, you know, he kept the hook and okay. and the flow. Like the way he was swung on filling it was how I was swung when I when I wrote the record. So he took the flow and he kept the hook. Yo, you're exactly so, right, man. When I think oh about it, man. You know, I can I can hear you spitting that when from the original. You know, <laughs> you know the, 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 the feeling it. Uh -huh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Classic. Nice, nice. Yep. You know, hey, man. But you know, I, I, I always like I always like uh, when I was when I'm making beats. I always like melodic type of beats. Like, I mean, I knew Primo for Nash and them. They had like, you know, Primo definitely had like the harder edge type of beats. And I didn't, you know, and I like Primo, but I didn't want to sound like Primo. So I always try to, you know, find super musical samples that I know, especially around that time, nobody was doing that. You know, like from the from the Lucinis and the Philinists and the Dead Presidents, nobody was right. using those type of samples. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. You know, and everybody was like hard, edgy, scratching, you know, you know, just like New York boom bap type of hip hop. So I wanted to change it up with, with the colors, with the with the music and stuff. How and much, um, hmm? how much of your North Carolina um, roots played a role into your um your your music? Uh, a hundred a hundred percent. Yeah, still to this day. You know, I'm from NC. I'm I'm from North Carolina, and everything musically I learned is from North Carolina. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Okay. So that's always going to be, um, that's yeah. enemy. That's in my DNA, bro. You know, another name you brought up, man, Mark Sparks, man. That's, mm -hmm. um, that's another name that I brought up in here, you know, not too long ago. And I specifically mentioned before, do you remember, I don't know, you. I'm sure you might have heard this because you're very well in the circle. So, you remember the early days of Anthony Hamilton when he was working with Mark Sparks? Yeah, Soul Life Records. That incredible work, man. That, mm -hmm. that just never saw the light of day. I was I was talking with my man DL about that. And you know, I don't want to get sidetracked, but since Mark Sparks' name came up, man, please co sign yeah. on how incredible that stuff was. Oh man, what what they was doing over there, Soul Life. With, with, with Anthony, Sunshine, all that. Their whole crew was musical, incredible. They was making some incredible music, man. I, I don't know. I never, like, went to L.A. when Mark was doing his thing full-time with that thing. But I was hearing what they was doing. I'm like, yo, this is really, really crazy. Yeah. But, um, ahead of his time yeah. at the moment, you know. 
Definitely. Yep. But you know, music industry, man, all types of stuff can happen, bro. All types of stuff can happen, man. Yes, indeed. But, you know, Anthony bounced. Anthony definitely bounced back. He definitely, you know, he, he was talented and he made it happen for sure. Yep, came back on a whole in a whole different not a different lane, but didn't even sound like the original stuff that we heard, and didn't have to. You know, he can do. Yeah, he's got incredible talent. range. Exactly, incredible range. So, so you've been you've been taking us on a journey through you know down your timeline, man. And this is extremely interesting. We appreciate this a whole lot, man. You know, this one's for posterity right here. You know, so it's all love, man. You already know. Yep. So. So right now, we're mm-hmm. we're we're into Jay Z's first album. And we're into Jay Z's first album, and I'm now I'm living in the Bronx while I'm making this album, and I'm living with this Puerto Rican girl and her mom and her brother. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Uh, they took they took me in, and um, big shout out to Evelyn Travieso. But anyhow, <laughs> I'm there. I'm in the Bronx. I'm on 197th in Valentine. And it's this little kid, always on the block. Him and his brother Haas, they're always on the block. One day, Evelyn, she hit me up and said, yo, Saladin, man, he he, uh, he raps. He wants to talk to you. So, you know, I met him. He came to the crib. I heard, I heard him rap. He was whack, but I liked his voice. <laughs> so, I, I, so I took him to Clark's house. And I made a little demo with him. And it came out pretty good. And I lost touch with him for a minute. But when he came back, then he came back with a partner, Sonny Chiba. Um, and 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 they had the name of their group was CeeLo, like the you know, the dice game. Right. But when I heard them rap together and I heard what they was rapping about and I saw how they was dressing and and, and they was just talking this, you know, incredible out of this world job talk, you know, that nobody's going to understand, but it was just, it was dope. You know what I'm saying? It was different. It was dope. It was wild abstract. Right. right. And, um, <laughs> you know, now mind you, when I started working on their album, I was working on Reason Without at the same time. So I'm at D&D and I got two rooms book. I got A and B book. I got Cam Low and B. I got Jay-Z and A. And I'm doing both albums at the same time, bro. <laughs> okay, so so you're 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 helping explain a part of a timeline for me because mm-hmm. when um okay, my brother, rest in peace. Yep. The time period that 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 we were involved with you and Charlie and Jocko is the time period right before Camp Low is coming out. But I'm not understanding that Camp Low has been waiting in the wings for years now. Because by the time this happened, it's uh-huh. a couple of years huh. later, right? So it, not, not, it wasn't it, it was it was like a, a year later. A year like later. I met Sway yeah. I met Sway, you know, we lost touch for a minute. But when he came back around, he was with Chi. And by that time I was living in Harlem um, I was living in the same building Dane was living in, and you know, and I was working on you know Reason Without, and I was working on them too. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, right, yeah, right. Because I, I remember, you know, at the time when um, before my brother passed away, the part of one of the things that we were excited about was, you know, they said Ski Ski got the the, the group Camp Low, and and they think we could get your spot on this soundtrack. I think it was was a great white hype or or was it oh uh, yeah hype? yeah yeah yep yep it was a great white hype soundtrack and you know my brother ended up passing away but I do remember their project being in work and work in works at the same time you know you know always, wow. yeah always always connect that in my head so you just get now now we hitting that part of the timeline you know there's a convergence. Yep. And my brother passed away in ninety five, so I know we're in in ninety five now, ninety four, ninety five. Mm-hmm. Okay, so so tell us a little bit more about the Camp Low project because this is this is interesting to me because you know I met those guys a, a lot in Greensboro. You see them in Greensboro a lot, you know, man, cool, real cool guys, man, down to earth dudes, man. I love those guys. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, tell us a little bit more about your relationship with them because I really didn't didn't know that much about y'all's relationship. So. Oh man, yeah, you know, like I said, Solid Man, Gigi Sway, he was um he lived like up 
So building over from where I was staying with um with Evelyn, and um, well, you know, we hit it off as soon as I met him. And, you know, and you know, I went to his crib, met his brother, his mom, everybody, and um, and it, like I said, man, the energy was right, man. Like I said, he was kind of whack at first, but I liked his voice, and I like his I like his hunger because it definitely reminded you know reminded me of me, you know, when I started with the Busy Boys. Right. But when he got it together, man, when he fucking connected with, with Chi, and mind you, Chi had never rapped before. So oh. Chi didn't even know how to rap. So you, to this day, to, to this day, Chi still can't rap, but he can rap. You know what I mean? Right. He's just, so his voice is so unusual. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, teach him um, how many bars and everything, when to quit, so the hook can come in and all that stuff, right? <laughs> that, that's it. All you had to teach him was bars, but you couldn't teach him how to flow. I mean, his flow was just so wild, unusual anyway, you know what I mean? Because you know what? Him not being able to rap was definitely a gift for him. Because yeah. he's just a job talker, and that's all he was doing on those records was just job talking. You know what I mean? Right, right. So, and it sounded dope. So, so. So we're gonna we're gonna roll the ball a little bit. Camp Low, you know, has their run, mm-hmm. but when Camp Low's run is over, your run continues to go on. So, you know, just yep. tell us about yeah. moving from one group to the next after that. Well, look, after I did, you know, after I produced Reasonable Doubt in Camp Low, um, you know, and all that stuff was done up in D and D Studios, and D and D was, you know, obviously. Primo's headquarters, you know what I mean? That was the spot. Right. So while you in D and D recording, everybody comes in. You see everybody Primo's working with. You see everybody that any producer that was doing hip hop back in the nineties is working with. So mm-hmm. that's why I met Bahamadia. Oh, um nice. And um and I end up but a matter of fact I end up doing that song that day I met him. And you know, I'm recording it live at D and D. And once I had Cam Lowe out, Bahamadia and Jay Z out at the same time on the charts, that's when like everybody, every artist in New York was calling me to do music. And then I kind of got real deep into the production game, you know, from the little Cams to the Foxy Browns to the, you know, Nas's. I was doing everybody's shit. And, you, and then, um, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I was going to say, um, you know, I kind of, I didn't even really connect the Bahamadia moment, but when I think this is this is the early days of my stint on 102 Jams, and mm-hmm. and during that time period, I just remember that the artists that came through seemed to have this warmth and familiarity with the area and, and the people, and it's, you know, when I hear you talk about, you know, all these people you're working with, you know, you have that connection. You got all these people passing through. I, I understand it a little bit better why certain people were so comfortable in Greensboro. And then, you know, yeah. you you had already mm-hmm. had dealings with these people. So when they come here, mm-hmm. you know, they're they're more comfortable. Like even when you just explained uh Dame Dash, I'm saying thinking like I remember meeting Bobby Dash and hanging out with him and he just always just so comfortable and I and it seemed like once he found out I'm from Greensboro he's comfortable because probably because oh, yeah, he knows yeah. you you see what I'm saying <laughs> yeah I, I mean I look I brought him down to Greensboro a couple times right right Bobby, I could Dan, tell Jay <laughs> uh-huh. yeah I could tell he, he just lightened up when, when I said Greensboro he's oh, and we, we hung out the rest of the weekend <laughs> there it is there it is yep mm-hmm. so, so okay yeah. so uh yeah, so you know, I ended up producing a lot of people, and then uh, then I got offered the uh, the Rocker Block situation, and that's you know how I connected with the Sporty Thieves, and ended up having my le- record label and dropping those guys, which was dope, dope experience. Uh, got uh, rest in peace, Brando. Right, right. Uh, that was amazing times, man. Amazing times. And then there's the Hot Right, the Hot Right. Oh yeah, um, then I did. Then I came it? after 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 Rocker Block. I came back home. You know what I mean? Oh, I yeah. moved back to NC. Oh yeah, got married, got a crib, and uh, and I got in, and the girl I was with at the time, before I got married, Dana, she said, "Hey, my sister's boyfriend, he raps. His name is Arthur Arthur Wright. I think he go by the name Hot Wright, but he want to meet you." As soon as I met Hot, I was like, "Yes, I like I love his voice, like you know, and, and his funny style of rapping was amazing." I'm like, "Yo, you, you know, like weird kind of with the raps, but it it worked for me." You know, he and, was. And that's, 
He was the precursor to Plies. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So, so he was definitely Plies. <laughs> he was definitely Plies. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Her high right, you know, we just, you know, she, the, the day after he came to the crib, we just started making songs. Then we came over, you know, the Right Now joint. And then he introduced me to Missy Wreck and Crunk. I met Crunk in Greensboro uh, to Wayne. I think Wayne was managing at the time. And Crunk was wild challenging, you know, playing the keys. He could sing, he could rap, he was dope. So that was the first now city. Missy Rack, High Right, and Crunk. Right. And then High Right, you know, he got his deal. And, he, you know, he went out and kind of ventured out on his own. And Crunk, Crunk was like a loner. You know what I'm saying? Crunk was more into, you know, what he was doing with his music. So he always wanted to, you know, do his thing. And, you know, and he had the challenge. 100% dope. You know what I'm saying? Right. And Missy, you know, she was just, Missy was just, Missy Rack, bro. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah she's, she's, she's rap, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, man. I, I mm-hmm. thoroughly enjoyed all those people. She's a, she's a wild she, man, shit, man. I wish, man, she would have got on, she would have been a problem to this day still, bro, because she was that ill. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but, look, but Little Rise was always around. You feel me? Yeah. Little Rise was always around because I was in Winston. So he would always be around Missy, always be like, he'll come through sometime with Hot Right. And, you know, and him and his brother Trav. And Roz, I liked his voice. I thought he was dope. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know how I met Kia. I met Kia Sniff. I don't know how I met her. Um, and, and Dolo, I always knew Dolo when he was with Nasty Fruit, Skaz and them out in Durham. And, they, you know, they always, was, they was always dope. They was like authentic hip-hop cats. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, full we, city. They don't, they don't yeah. be playing. Yeah, I'm in Durham mm-hmm. now. You know what I'm saying? Oh, okay, okay. So yeah. you know. Yeah, indeed. I yeah. see, I see a lot of them cats all the time now. Mm-hmm. So what I met when when I connected with Rise and, and Kia, you know, I said I need to find somebody. So I reached out to Dolo. He said he was with it. So they came to the crib. We sat down. We started recording records, and it, it, it came out good. We ended up getting them a deal. They went on the Grey Goose tour. They was doing their thing. It was about to be big, man. But damn, it just kind of it just didn't fucking go all the way. You know what I'm saying? That curl just didn't curl all the way, my dude. But nah. if it would have, yeah, I, I would have still been home. All right. Well, let me let me get your opinion on a topic that we did a whole podcast about. And it was, okay. um, well, part of it was why North Carolina never quite broke, you know, when, when we've had so much talent. My, my thing was that we never really had a definable sound that stood out. So we could we put people out there, and you know, but until we find somebody that has a definable sound that everybody could could latch on to, it's hard for one area to you know to get any traction. That was my take on it. But now, well, I mean, it, it, it was that, and at the time, you know, hip hop, you know, it was kind of new, especially when I came around doing my thing, and, and we didn't have a full understanding of how. If we like, if we as a state support our artists for real and really show love, the majors players will take notice of that and bring more, you know, attention to the area. How they doing the baby? See how the baby is doing this thing now, right? Because the the area is supporting him. You know what I mean? Right, right. And they, if they would have did that for us back when we started. We would have never had, you know, I would have never had to go to New York to, yeah. to you know, get what I wanted to get. Well, I got a, I got a question for you. I don't, like, when I was on the radio, like, you know in Greensboro, we, we were holding you down big time in Greensboro. So, oh, yeah, for sure. But was it a struggle getting support from the rest of the state? You know, I know, you know, Greensboro, Winston-Salem, you know, of course, they're all over it. You know what I mean? Yeah, they, I mean they they, I they show they show love they show love, but what we needed them to do is buy them records and them CDs, right? Because you know the sales, you know what I'm saying. We was getting the spins on the radio, but the sales wasn't translating. Right. If we'd have got them sales, boy, you know they would have took notice, man. Right, right, gotcha. They would have took notice, but yeah. like I said, I had to I had to leave Greensboro just to you know go after what I wanted to go after. Yeah, because I knew I could do it, but I just had to. Be what was happening, you know what I mean? Right, right. So, so I, I've, I've been noticing, like you know, we we talk a lot about the evolution of music, 
And uh-huh. and we we come from an analog world, you know. We we grew up with with tapes, and we played vinyl, and we sampled uh-huh. on eight bit, um, you know, SPs. Um, mm-hmm. And now things, everything's digital. And I was I was talking before you before you got on. I was saying, hey man, when you're talking about ski, you're talking about a guy who's who's been able to make the transition every step of the way. And, you know, for me, that's been a challenge. Like after, you know, after the ASR, I've been kind of lost, Ski. Been kind of lost. <laughs> <laughs> it happens, it happens. You know what I'm saying? But I was telling them that that not only have you kept up with what's going on, you know, I, I see you on, on YouTube explaining how to work the machine, you know, and that yeah. that intrigues me. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. I'm thoroughly impressed by your ability to keep up with what's going on because it, people don't understand how much time it takes to be on top of this stuff and be able to to work all this stuff. So tell us a little bit about what you had to do to be able to get to this place as well because outside of producing music and, and, and discovering artists, you know, you're behind the scenes with machine innovation, are you not? Man, look, man. And the new NPCs, machine, Ableton, everything, anything, I can work it. Because <laughs> you know what? You got to look at it like this. First of all, I'm just a straight nerd when it comes to anything electronic. I got to figure it out. You know what I'm saying? I, I have to. That's just how I'm built. I'm always trying to figure shit out. Uh, and secondly, man, you know, technology, man, you know, you got you to gotta roll with it. Yeah, you got to roll with it, man. Yeah. Now that Dana passed away, I'm lost, man. I don't have anybody to explain this stuff to me. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's it's, it's all it's, it's all the same thing. It's just you know, like native might be Chinese, uh, Ableton might be Japanese, you know, Akai might be American. I mean, it's all it's all the same thing. They all speak the same language. You just got to figure out how to translate it. That's all. They all do the same thing, bro. Sample, chop. <laughs> sequence you know what i mean right they all right. do the exact same thing it don't take no time to learn that stuff so so tell me how how did um so how do you end up like when i see you on the official novation page explaining something or you know on their youtube is that do you, are you working for them when you do that or they just know you're really good at it and can and they just use a, a you know a clip from from something how does that work uh, no, nah, they they hire you. You know what I'm saying? They hire you. I mean, nowadays these companies are looking for influencers. You know that they're right. looking for you know influencers that use their equipment that people respect, and you know that maybe you know they'll get a couple sales from it. So when I'm working with these companies from Ableton to um, Native to Kai, you know that's that's what they want. They want me to you know. Show some videos of me doing what I do on it, and maybe you know they'll get some sales and shit. Right, it's right. fun, you know. It, 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 it's it's fun. It's cool. Yeah, and I, I wanted to make sure that that we got that we went over that because mm-hmm. um, a lot of people need to understand, especially young people that want to yeah. be involved in hip hop. You know, they see rappers, they see DJs, and you know they see producers. And they see sales, they see shows, but yeah. there's so many avenues within, you know, within the music where you can get paid yeah. and earn a living doing things. And and you telling us about how you are able to, you know, you're an influencer and they, they want you, you know, they want you to show you working their equipment. That's another avenue that I want people in the, in the hip hop world to know about that that's a way for oh, you to earn out here, you know, that people oh, might yeah, not have known was even available. You know what I mean? Look, you got to look at it, man. You got these kids that's like 17, 18, 19 years, 19 years old on YouTube channels for the million subscribers. They making like 250K a month getting checks from YouTube, hmm. being influencers, talking about equipment. You know what I mean? Right, right. It's, 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 like, a, it's like a whole, bruh, it's a whole other world, kid. Like you know, you know, I'm doing the, the Smack Pack challenges on on my IG page. I don't know if you follow me on IG, but yes, every month, you know, I do the challenges for the producers, and they be tapping in. They love that, man. You know, and I love that they love that because you know that just reminded me when I first started making beats, and I wanted people to you know hear my music, or whatever. But we got a whole community. We probably got like 
five to six hundred people strong that's just posting beats, you know, every month, which is crazy. Word. That's what's mm-hmm. up, man. Yeah, I bought a I bought a machine about two or three years ago. And okay. now that I'm in Durham instead of Greens, but you know, at the time, you know, I would get something, I sit down, like, you know, people like Showdown, uh, Dana, uh, Chaos, folks in Greens, but I could just go sit down with that might already have one of the machines. You know, you can just pick up some stuff, watch them work it for a little while, and it, and it cuts out all that reading that I gotta do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, because Chaos, Chaos is the man. Yeah, he told me that's man. that's what he said. He said, "Yo, but but now I'm in Durham, so I got to make my way back up there and spend some time, man." So there's nothing, mm-hmm. there's nothing like being there, man. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. So, yep. so that's um, man, you got you got an incredible story. So where are we now? What's what's going on? Okay, we we got all the way up through Camp Low and and everything, and we talked about mm-hmm. the production and how things have changed. What you got going yep. on today? Is there is there anybody that we should be looking out for? Well, you know, we got uh, uh, I think we're dropping Pilot Talk for on Christmas. That's with Currency. Mm. Um, yeah, I produced the whole album. It should be out on Christmas. That's going to be. I think. I think you know the real Jet Life is going to uh, appreciate that album. Um, and you know, I got the. Um, you know, I be I be teaching too, man. I got. Um, I got a couple of curriculums in um in um Casual County right now, teaching kids how to use Ableton. So I'm in the classrooms in uh Casual County, ninth, tenth, eleventh grade. Got the ski beef curriculum going on down there, the dojo oh, curriculum. That's what's up. Um, man. Mm-hmm. And you know, obviously we're doing the challenges. Um and I'm 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 really deep in the sound design right now. I'm doing a lot of sound design stuff. So I'm doing these sample packs. Um, and I'm, and, and I'm, but I'm reinventing how I, how, how to market them opposed to, you know, uh, me saying, Hey, come get my sounds. You know, I do the challenges. I give, I give opportunities right now. We're doing a smoke pack. And basically the smoke pack is every month. Smoke Dizza is writing a whole song. I'll send smoke Dizza beat break. They'll write a verse hook, verse hook, you know what I'm saying? And right. he'll send it back to me. And then I'll include that in the pack, pack, the acapella version. And so the producer's job, it's to create a song with it. And, yeah. uh, you know, and whatever song Smoke like, he'll put it on the album. So right now we got a community-based album being produced. We got our first song uh, from my man Landscape from Canada. He killed it. And we're doing the next one in like three weeks. And we're just going to build an album that'll be like 10 songs, but produced by, you know, the community. You know what I mean? Uh, you know what? I'm about to get in mm-hmm. there, Ski. <laughs> Jump in. Let's I'm go. about to get in that, man. I'm gonna grab some old ASR stuff. <laughs> it's ready to rock, though. I'm telling you, <laughs> we'll be glad to have you, man. Come on. So, <laughs> so that's what you got going on. You're teaching, you're teaching the, the youth how to rock out mm-hmm. on this digital equipment and get their sound recording on, right? Oh yeah, for sure. You know, it's crazy because in school now, there's like a lack of attendance when it comes to like band. Like nobody's wanting to pick up a horn or some drums, but everybody want to get on some software and try to be the next, you know, big producer. And that's where the kids are at. They love it, man. They having fun with it. I mean, we, we sell out the class sells out every year. Yeah. And it's, and it's financially feasible too. Cause these kids are recording stuff in their bedrooms. Like think about mm-hmm. the sound quality they're able to get right now, man, with the simplest of, of equipment. Like, Crazy, this stuff. Man. like we just we used to pay like $400 an hour to get that sound quality. Okay. Now you can, Right. Download a free app and you rock it. You sound right. like a million dollar studio. Right. It's insane, man. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. Things change so much, man. Now, the lastly, lastly, we talk about a whole we talk about music a lot, right? And mm-hmm. we talk about influences from all over the place. So I think uh, the other day we were talking about the influence of Go Go and I just wanna get you in on this conversation about how influential right. Go Go was on hip hop. You know what I'm saying? And, oh uh, man, come on! Hey, you know, and and as a producer, I w- I want to like I'm I'm speaking producer talk, like mm-hmm. the the way that beats were made, the introduction of Go Go brought the bounce into hip hop. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I was gonna say if you listen to their president's number Go Go, that that skip, right? 
Beat that's go go. That's something that only another producer understands when I'm talking about it. You know, when you when you when you click T on your SP. <laughs> uh huh. You know what I'm saying? So you get that that triple. Uh -huh. You know, and and that sound, you know, is 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 meshed with the early days of hip hop all the way through. I was, t I was explaining on one of the podcasts, like we had Trouble Funk playing for the Sugar Hill Gang back in the day. You know, they were they were the house band at Sugar Hill Records briefly. You know, you knew about that. So mm -hmm. of course, Go Go is gonna be a major influence on hip hop. Cause you know, my man DL at first he was like, I don't like Go Go. I was like, you ain't heard the right Go Go on boy. If you like hip hop, you like Go Go. If you say oh, you yeah. don't, you ain't heard the right Go Go yet. And Go Go's amazing. <laughs> yes, indeed. Go Go is amazing. Yes, indeed. Brought so much to the game. And mm -hmm. it, man, look, Go Go is, is so much a part of my life, man. I used to go to all the ANT jams, man. That's you know, ANT being the melting pot, and you know, it's a billion Go Go people with ANT. So you go to the to that little gym jam they used to do all the time. That's all you used to hear the DJ play, especially K Nice. Sorry, yeah. hey. That shit is dope, bro. <laughs> right, right. And I was explaining to DL that, you know, Go Go used to have rappers. You know, you used to be just as likely to hear your rap in a Go Go song as you did in mm -hmm. hip hop, you know? I was explaining them early mm -hmm. days of Trouble Funk and, and Rare Essence when they had rappers kicking the joints, you know what I mean? Yeah, it, it, it was a different kind of cadence, but it was still rap. Right. There's still MCs on the mic, but it was more like party. They was always amped and trying to get you hyped. You know what I mean? Yep, yep. And uh, the what pump me up? You had Grandmaster Flash did one version, but also had already been done by Trouble Funk. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? They, yeah, man, them joints were hard back in the day. So you know, I'm just I always got to feel like I got to defend Go Go sometimes to hip hop heads. <laughs> nah, go 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 man. You know yeah, what I mean? Look, I'm, I'm, I love Go Go man from the madness, the madness hats and the socks. But well, I mean the old school Go Go when it first hit North Carolina it was wow. Yes, colorful. Sir. It was yes. super colorful. <laughs> yes, yes, man. We could do this all night, man. I'm telling you, but we, but unfortunately, you know, we got to keep it down to to something that people can that's palatable. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey. Nobody gonna listen to a three hour podcast. <laughs> <laughs> got you. Hey, but for real, man, Ski, man, we appreciate every ounce of this, man. And you know, I, every time I see you, man, I tell you, thank you for everything you've done for us in the past, man. And that's, you know, I'm talking about me and my people. You know what I mean? So. I uh, mean, I appreciate y'all. You already know. Yep. So I say it again. And um, anything you want to add, DL? Man, uh, thank you for taking the time. You know, um, we're building. Uh, um, a strategic fan base over here with this specialized conversation and dialogue that we're having and you add nice. value to what we have going on. So I just want to, you know, and, and, and well, because we talk about hip hop and North Carolina hip hop, I couldn't do another episode without actually talking to someone who I know is homegrown and uh, is of legend status and not for, I, I think it's so dope because it's not just for words, not to downplay words, but because of putting sounds together. And sometimes people say North Carolina doesn't have a sound. Um, North Carolina might not have a uniform sound, but if you listen to a lot of NYC-ish, it sounds very North Carolina to me. No I was gonna say, man. No, look. Let me say, a lot of North Carolina cats gave a lot of New York brothers. They sound, bro. Thank you. And right on. What big say, dude? I mean, uh, Jada said, dude brought the East back. I think he was talking about the cat. Hey, <laughs> look, all these dudes. A lot of people secretly from the South, anyway. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> But it's everybody's just, from the south. Yeah, no, somewhere, no. somewhere with another. Everybody's from the south, bro. Absolutely. Amen. It's Amen. just, it's, it's just something about them Carolina boys, and I think you, like I said, you're a legend, and you know, I thought it was important that we did have this conversation because I feel like this. I'm sitting next to a legend, also, and um, you know, so that we're just gonna keep this thing going, you know, and keep keep it of of, of substance. So we appreciate yes, you. I appreciate you taking the time out, brother. Not a problem, man. Thank you. Okay. Well, you take care. 
All right, y'all be cool. All right, Ski, we'll be in touch, man. This is Capital City with Capital J.